Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You know, I was standing in the back listening to Dave talk, and he talked about the principles of connection. I think that's the way he put it. I'm going to show you something uh, here before I'm done based on the principles of connection. And I thought it rather uh, sort of strange that he would be talking about that because um, I'm going to show you from probably from a spiritual perspective or from a psychological perspective how we actually do connect and it's not something everybody understands you know we're talking here about creating your own economy there's a lot of paradoxes in life and this is one of them when you create your own economy, it's got nothing to do with the economy. It has to do with your thinking. And when we really understand that, I think that's when we start to maneuver in the direction we really want to move and enjoy the life that God decided that we should enjoy. And many years ago, when I first... I remember the first record I ever heard. I was um, I was into the book Think and Grow Rich, and everywhere I went, I was like a Napoleon Hill disciple. I was going to save the whole world. Everybody had to buy that book, and I'd buy all they had in a store, and I would give them away, and then I'd go back and I'd buy more, and I'd give them away. And I probably imagine that half the people never read it that I gave it to, and the other half probably maybe didn't even understand it. But I kept doing this, and I gave it to a man one time, Harold Rose. He worked for City Buick Pontiac in Toronto. And I was very enthusiastic about this book. I mean, everybody had to have the book. And Harold said, you really like this, do you? And I said, yeah, I really do. So anyway, he said, come on with me. And he took me home, and he put a record on, a long playing record. Now... I never heard anybody talk like this record before. It was by Charlie Cullen. Charlie's long gone, but Charlie came from Charlotte, North Carolina, and he was a phenomenal speaker. And I got so jazzed listening to this record, I wanted to borrow it. He wouldn't even let me touch it. He said, no. He said, if you want one, you can go down to Sam's or a, &A Records down on Young Street, downtown Toronto, and Gwen asked for sales motivation records. So I went in, and they, uh, this room would have made that record store look small. Uh, the, uh, they had records in bins, and you'd go through the bins, and they'd have, you know, for different areas. So anyway, if my head had been screwed on right, I would have bought all the records in the sales motivation bin. But I'm looking for Charlie Cullen's record, and I couldn't find it. But I did find Think and Grow Rich on a record. And I recognized it right away because it had the same cover on it that is on uh, that was on the book. And so I bought the record, and I took it home. I have, uh, I have not that record, but one exactly like it sitting on my mantle at home. And every now and then I have a record player down beside my desk and I lift it up, a little battery operated record player, and I put it on and I listen to it. Just for old time's sake, you know, I could put a little nano in my ear and listen to it. But I like to play the record. And so I play this record. Now I drove around playing that record for a long, long time. And I'm going to tell you what happened because I did that. But one of the other records I picked up was by Elmer Wheeler. And he said, nothing happens till somebody sells something. I thought that was pretty interesting. And he also said, sell the sizzle, not the steak. And he was a guy that said, people don't buy quarter-inch drills because they want quarter-inch drills. People buy quarter-inch drills because they want quarter-inch holes. Now, that really saved my life at one point because I was out trying to sell records for Nightingale Conant later on, and I couldn't sell them. But then that registered in my mind, so I put the records away and started to sell what the records would do. And so as a result, I'm still in the business. 
But selling is uh, is the highest paid rest profession in the world. Now think of this. In every situation, there's a buyer and there's a seller. The seller is the highest paid professional in the world. No one can earn the kind of money that a professional salesperson can earn. Now, this is rather strange because it's something like acting, I suppose. You'd say actors are the highest paid, but they're also the lowest. Well, salespeople are the highest paid, and they're also the lowest. But the potential is there to earn, literally earn millions of dollars. Now, there's something stopping that, and that's what I want to talk to you about for a while here, and that's paradigms. Paradigms stop us right in our tracks. They really do. And most people don't know what a paradigm is. If you um, asked your neighbor, they probably don't know. They may not even know how to spell it. Um, but paradigms are really controlling our life. I heard Dave asked you, how many would like to know what's stopping you? Well, I'll tell you in one word. It's your paradigm. Now, he'll go through some analysis in their test, and I would imagine they're pretty accurate. And he'll tell you this paradigm or that paradigm or this habit or that habit. Because it's all habit patterns. That's what a paradigm is. It's a multitude of habits. Now, a long time ago, uh, in fact, in 1961, I've been at this business for a long time. I've been at it longer than most of you have been living. Uh, that is when my life really took a change because I was given this book. And I've been reading this particular copy since 1963. I had one for a couple of years before that. But my brother had this one bound in Morocco leather and gave it to me as a gift in 1963. It took them six months to get the book back because the people that were binding it were reading it. And they didn't want to give it back to us. You see? But I've never stopped reading this book. And when it comes to Napoleon Hill, there's probably not many people alive, with the possible exception of Don Green in the back, that really know what Hill did any better than I did. I mean, I go back, I've studied Carnegie. I've uh, mentally been in the room when Carnegie posed the big question to him. I've asked myself, how would I answer the question? And, and uh, it's just such a phenomenal trip this man went on. And he studied 500 of the world's most successful people. So the man that gave me the book, he said, listen, if you do exactly what I tell you, do exactly what you think he's telling you, you're going to win. Now, I had no reason to believe that. Um, I was 26 years old, and I had never wanted anything in my life. I got kicked out of school when I was in high school for two months. I had uh, no business experience. I worked at dumb jobs. I went in the Navy. I come out of the Navy. I worked in bars and in factories. And in fact, I, um, I was on the fire department. That was the best job I ever got. And uh, when I read this book, now most people who go on the fire department, they die there, you know, because they're, they're only working seven days or seven nights a month. And they're virtually retired. Uh, and especially if you're in a hall I was in, because there wasn't even any fires. I mean, it was in real imposition. If we had to get up in the middle of the night and go put out a fire, we'd, we would go in there, go sleep, and then go play golf. And so, you know, it was, a, it was actually a pretty good job for me, and that was the best job I'd ever had. But I started to read this book. And when I started to read the book, my mind was on a different frequency of thought than everybody else in the fire hall, and my life started to change. Now, this book literally changed the course of my life. When I picked it up to read it, I was earning $4,000 a year, and I owed $6,000. And he said, you know, write what you want on a card. Carry the card in your pocket and read it as often as possible every day. Now, I've been doing that since October 1961. And I wrote on the card that I was going to have in my possession by New Year's Day of uh, 1970, $25,000. I, I gave myself a decade to pull this deal out. Uh, I really didn't believe it was going to happen. I didn't even know anyone with $25,000. We'd have had to sell one of the pumpers or the aerial ladders to come up with that kind of money. Um, but I kept reading the card. And I kept reading the book. And I kept listening to the record. Now, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was literally changing my paradigm. It took me 10 years to figure that out. But you know, in nothing flat, I started to earn money. 
Now, a year later, I was earning $175,000 a year. And not too long after that, I was earning over a million dollars a year. I have come to the conclusion that earning money is one of the simplest things anybody can learn. It's just that most people don't believe that, and so they never really study how to earn money. You earn money by providing service. The loss is given, you'll receive. But we, we're not raised to believe that. We're raised to do anything. It's trade. You know, I'll give you this if you give me that. And we're really not taught to give. Well, the more you give, the more you're going to receive. It's a basic concept. It's, in fact, Emerson said it was the law of laws. This entire universe operates by law. There are no accidents. Warren von Braun, I quote him on the secret, he said that the natural laws of this universe are so precise that we don't have any difficulty building spaceships, sending people to the moon, and we can time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. He also said these laws must have been set by someone. He said after years of studying the spectacular mysteries of the cosmos, he had come into a firm belief in the existence of God. Now here's the father of the space program, great scientist. And we always thought science and religion were antagonistic. They're not. They're right on the same track. One studies the cause and the other studies the effect. That's my opinion anyway. Well, here I was. I, I was winning. And I didn't know why. And I had to start asking myself some questions. And I wanted to know why was I winning? I had had a real screwed up past. Never really got in any trouble, but I never did anything of any consequence. So, I mean, I was losing all the time. I was going down lots of roads, but they're always the wrong road. And when anybody come along and give me good advice, it, it was like a foreign language. I just didn't listen to it. And so I just kept losing. Now, I've been raised to believe if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. But I was earning a lot of money, and I knew I wasn't very smart. And so I thought, that can't be true. Then I had been raised to believe if you're going to win in business, you've got to have a good formal education. Well, I didn't have any. I mean, two months high school, and I probably cheated to get that far. And, and I didn't just have a good position. I owned the company. You see, when I carried that card for the 25000 I heard someone say, there's good money cleaning offices. I said, I'm not proud. I'll clean offices. So I got a contract to clean one office. $15 a time. I'll wash the floor twice a month. Then I got a contract. It was Canada Starch on Comstock Road in Toronto. I'll never forget it. Then I got a contract to clean Kirby's Construction. That was 65 a month. Now I'm up to 95 a month. Now I was only earning 400 a month to start with. Well, do you know, in less than five years, I was cleaning offices in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, and London, England. We were going like a rocket. And I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. But that's not unusual. I've gone to work for some of the largest companies in the world. I worked, I did a lot of work with the Prudential. That's the largest insurance company in the world. They do not know why their stars are stars. Rudy Michaud phoned me about two years ago. He ran 40% of Metropolitan Life. He said, my daughter saw something about you on the internet, and I just wanted to phone and thank you for all the good work you did for our company. This was 25 years before. They didn't know why their stars were stars. You went to the largest companies in the world. They do not know why their top people are top people. Do you know almost everyone that wins in a big way is an unconscious competent. They cannot articulate on why they're winning. Yet for the very same reason, 97% of our population are stuck. It's not that they're not smart enough. They are smart enough. They got the education. We got people walking the streets with a master's and a, and a doctorate in commerce and finance, and they're, and they're in debt. They don't know how to earn money. 80% of the people that are teaching have never done what they're teaching. I want you to think about some of this, because I'm going to show you something here that's rather startling. How the heck did that happen to me? Well, I want to know. And since that's what I was looking for, that's exactly what I found. I want to know why I was winning. It took me nine years, but I found out. And I'm going to share it with you. And I started listening to Think and Grow Rich, and then I started to listen to The Strangest Secret. And after having my own business and earning a few hundred thousand dollars a year, I took a job for $18,000 a year. 
Five years later, I was earning 33. I went to work with an Ideal Conine Corporation. You see, Earl and Lloyd were my mentors, and I worked with them for five years. I was prepared to pay them to let me work there because I knew that he knew what I was looking for. Now, I not only got to work with Earl, I got to work with Lloyd. I got to be their vice president of sales. Now, the only reason I didn't want to be the vice president of anything, I wanted an office beside his. And I got an office beside both of them. And if um, Earl ordered a book, his secretary ordered me one. She always had some money of mine. If, she, if he subscribed to a magazine, I got a magazine. She subscribed for me. If he had an important appointment with Lowell Thomas or Eric Hoffer or somebody coming in, I would study up in them. And when they walked out of his office, I would step out of my office and I'd introduce myself. And I asked for a couple of minutes. Some of these people became my friends. But I started to pick some of the most phenomenal minds that ever walked on the planet. I want to know, why did I change? You see, I just didn't buy into the idea that there was some emotional or capricious God on a cloud somewhere that blessed me and left everyone else to sink. I did not believe that. And so I kept studying. And I kept studying. And I found that most people are extras in their own movie. They really are. Now, I put the dots together, I figured it out, and as Dave mentioned a few minutes ago, he was talking about being shy, I was shy. I was very shy, I was very quiet, and very withdrawn. And I would never ask a question in a crowd. I had just a ton of information in my head. I not only knew how to win, I knew how to teach people to win. But I was afraid to talk. And I was very frustrated because I had all this information inside of me. My nature is I'm very cerebral, very quiet, very withdrawn. That was my nature. But I was in a meeting at the back of the hotel, at the back of the ballroom in the O'Hare Hyatt. And Bill Gove was the speaker. And Bill had a handheld mic and he's looking out over an audience. And he said, if I want to be free, I've got to be me. Not to me that I think you think I should be. Not to me I think my wife thinks I should be. Not to me that I think my kids think I should be. If I want to be free, I've got to be me. Now I'm sitting in the back of the room and I'm thinking, my God, this guy ever good at what he's doing. If only I could do that. Now, let me digress for a moment. On Earl Nightingale's Magic Word, that's the first record in his Lead the Field series, at one point he says, now right here we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we can do, the goals we can accomplish, and for some equally strange reason, we think other people can accomplish things that we cannot. He says, I want you to understand that's not true. That you have deep reservoirs of talent and ability within you. You can bring them to the surface. Now, if you'd asked me if I understood that, if you played the record, I'd say, of course I understood it. Hell, I'd listened to it a couple of thousand times, probably. Of course I understand that. I didn't understand it at all. I could repeat it. I could even mimic him and do it and do a pretty good job. But I didn't understand it because here I was watching Bill go, thinking, if only I could do that. And all of a sudden, that record started to play in my head. Now, right here, we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the thing. I thought, that's what he means by that. That's exactly what he means. And I made up my mind right then that I was not only going to learn to do what Bill Gove was doing, I was going to get him to teach me. And Bill Gove and I were the very best of friends right up until he died. In fact, I phoned him just the day before he died. And they, I didn't get talking to him. I was talking to his daughter, but she told him that I was on the phone. And Bill passed away. Now, the last time he spoke was at a conference that I was running for our company. It was down in Florida. That was in October. Bill passed away early December. If he had lived till January, he would have been 90. And I had this thing professionally videotaped. We had multiple cameras around. It was a real professional shoot. And after he died, I thought, wow, that is worth something. And then I thought, 
of what he gave me. And so I phoned Steve Siebold, who was his partner, and I phoned Ada, his widow, and I said, I've got something that I think belongs to you, and I gave them the video. That was the last talk Bill Gove meant. Now, if you never saw Bill Gove, you missed something because he was considered the Frank Sinatra of speakers. He was absolutely incredible. And I've been around long enough that most of these people were pretty good friends of mine. I heard Dave up here talking about Og, Og Mandino and I were very... Uh, when I was the VP of sales at Miguel Conan, Og was the um, editor of Success Unlimited, a little... Um, house organ for combined insurance and uh, that was the forerunner for success magazine so i'd go around the corner and i'd shoot the breeze with him we'd go for lunch or something like that and we just became good friends we had a lot in common we studied the same stuff and i went there one day and dave suggested i tell you this story i wasn't going to tell it but i was thinking it would be a good story to share with you and uh, I was in his office one day and he, he said, you know, Helen and I are having some real problems. Uh, and he started, he wanted to know if I would tell him what to do. And I said, oh, Og, I said, that's, <laughs> that's way out of my area of expertise. And um, I quickly changed the subject. Helen's his wife. And I got back to my office and his book was on my desk greatest salesman. So I wrote a note in it. I said, to Og, the answer you're looking for is in this book. Love and Light, Bob Proctor. And I went right back to his office and I gave it to him. And I said, here, Og, read the book. The answer you're looking for is in this book. Now, we have to move ahead about 25 years. I didn't see, I saw him, uh, Og off and on, but then I didn't see him for a long time. Jeannie Robertson, uh, the Rice Trends, and myself, and Og were on a program in Toronto. And um, Jeannie and the Rice Twins and myself were having dinner at the hotel. Um, Og was coming in on a later flight. He came in, and he still had a leather jacket on that, and he put his bags down, he came over and gave us all a hug, and he said, oh, he says, I got something for you. And he went back, and he dug a book out of his bag, and he came back, he said to me, you can have this back. It worked. And so I've got that book in my library to Og. The answer you're looking for is in this book. Okay. So if you're reading the greatest salespeople in the world, greatest salesmen in the world, and you're having problems, that'll solve all kinds of problems. Most people are extras in their own movie. See, I was extra in my own movie. Bill was a star, but not me. Well, the truth is, we're all stars. It's just that some of us are not shining very bright. But we can, and we can turn the, the light up with will. Now, there's what you got to ask yourself. What do I really want? What do I really want? If we answer, ask that question, good things start to happen. Good things just start to happen. Now, from here on, I'm not going to talk about me or anything that I'm doing. I want to talk about you. And... Uh, I had a package here. Uh, this is a program. And where's Gina? Gina, there's a pixie in the room? She's not here. Well, I want you to give that lady in the back of the room a hand. Gina, give her a big hand. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Gina has worked with me for 27 years. She... Uh, she makes sure everything's looked after. And I said, Gina, Greg said this is a strange seminar. It's called the secret knock. And I don't know what was secret about it. I thought maybe it was a Masonic order or something. <laughs> and, uh, and, well, I got a secret handshake. Oh, this is a secret knock. <laughs> But how's that song going? You know, three times you whisper low. There's a song about that. Anyway, <laughs> the song's older than you, too. Anyway, Gene and Pixie come down, and they wrapped 235 of these. This is a phenomenal program. I'll tell you a little bit about it as I get into it. And if you were to go online, 
program would cost you about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars. And I said to Gina, Greg doesn't want to selling anything there, so we're going to give this program to everybody. All right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is, that's good, this is an incredible program. I'll tell you a bit about how it was made. There's 12 DVDs and an exercise book. It is cre really an extraordinary program. We spent a, a lot of money shooting this. It's very well done. Um, we train people to teach this. We have consultants in, I think, 94 countries that are teaching this program, uh, thinking into results. It's extremely well done. And uh, I got an idea as I was sitting in the back of the room. We're giving you this. You can take it. You don't even have to give us anything for it. And uh, uh, it's all gift wrap for you. And I think Greg's going to figure out how to hand them out. Uh, now, they're giving money to the Napoleon Hill Foundation, which happens to be one of my very favorite places. And I thought it'd be a good idea uh, of you to um, give the Napoleon Hill Foundation something so that they can keep this great work going. And so whatever you think that might be worth to you, you might say, here, I'm going to give this to the Hill Foundation. Now, if you don't want to pay them, that's fine. You just take it because I've given it to you. It's yours. It's a gift. But there's, there's 52 years of in-depth research in that, in that program. That is not a light program. Now, I'm going to proceed now to tell you something about what's in that program. You know, um, Buckminster Fuller was a pretty bright guy. He changed everybody's paradigm. He said, you never change things by fighting existing reality. To change things, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Well, you know, the first time I read that, that's, I thought that's exactly what I did when I got this book. I built a new model. Yet it made the old model obsolete. I have had the most phenomenal experience in life. I work all over the world, literally. In another week, I'll be in Taiwan. Um, here today, I'll be in Toronto tomorrow. Uh, but I, I travel all over the world. And everywhere I go, people know this book. They, uh, they understand that there's good information in here. This is the kind of material that lasts forever. See, in 1908, Carnegie knew how valuable the information was. He was very selective, and he picked the right guy to go and study the laws of achievement and put it together in an organized, coherent manner so that you and I could benefit from it. He said it was a shame that people like himself were going to the grave with all the knowledge in their bones and turn into dust. That is such a wise statement. You do not change things. Some of you are trying to fight existing reality. It doesn't work. Now, I want you to keep your eye on the ball here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now show you some of the most valuable information that I have learned in the past 52 years. Without question, it is some of the most valuable information that I have ever come across. Now, we talk about the mind-money connection. Everybody wants to learn how to earn more money. There's nothing to it. But you see, most people don't understand the mind. See, no one's ever seen the mind. Mind is not a thing. Mind is movement. The body is the manifestation of that movement. If you just stand and watch the way a person behaves, you'll know what's going on in their mind because their body's an instrument of their mind. Whatever's going on in the mind is expressed through the body. The body is an instrument of the mind. Now, the mind, let that circle represent the mind. I let the person's head represent the mind. I can just glance at you and I can tell you all kinds of things about you. Like, I don't know your name. What's your name? Tom Brown. Tom Brown. Tom Brown's a very left brain guy. If you're going to sell him something, you want to take your time. You've got to give him lots of facts and figures. If he tells you he's broke, you know he's not telling you the truth. He's saying, you haven't made me want what you've got. Because he's always got some money stuck away for a rainy day. Now, you, on the other hand, what is your name? Ron Barron. Ron, Ron has got a shy side to him. 
you know, he, he has a very sensitive side to him. You can hurt his feelings very easy. But he's also got that left brain side to him, too. You operate from both hemispheres of your brain. So you don't have, uh, have conflicts. Do it, don't do what's going on in your mind a lot. See, the emotional, sensitive, right brain side of you, it's impulsive. The other side's very orderly and articulate time. And, and it's saying, don't do it. Do it. Don't do it. Do it. Don't do it. So if I were selling you guys, I would really know which way to go. I'd be very tuned into your energy. And if you happen to be in your right brain, they're going to move like a rocket. And if you move over into the left brain, I take my time, give you facts and figures. Now, I don't have to ask them if I'm right. I know I'm right. I know this is a woman. I know that's a man. You'll say, Bob, that is brilliant. How did you figure that out? Well, you see, you'll say, everybody knows she's a woman and he's a man. No, everybody doesn't know it. Babies don't know it. Baby has to become aware of the difference in gender. Do you know what our problem is? At a very early age, we stop developing awareness. And you know, we're into, we're into the intellect. What's two plus two? What's this and that? And so we go crazy on the intellect. And we've got people walking out of universities today. They're up to here in debt. Yet it can't be bankrupt. The school debt is greater in the United States of America than the credit card debt. And they can't even find work. They're paying a fortune to gather information they're never going to use. It's rather interesting. Well, let that represent the mind. And you'll find something. Now, let's put a body on it and bring it down here where we can work on it. Now, you look at this. The top half would be the conscious mind, and the bottom half would be the subconscious mind. And then that small circle at the bottom will represent the body, and the body moves into action and produces the results that we get in our life. Now, that's sort of the way it works. Now, we're sitting there getting these results, but we've got this dream. If I could only do this, and we've all got a dream. And you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to get there by fighting existing reality. You see, what got you there, what got you there isn't going to get you there. There's a big gap in between here. You've got to figure out how to close the gap. See, there's a paradigm that's controlling your behavior, and the paradigm's got you locked into the results you're getting. Now look at it this way for a moment. Let on these lines that you're going to see come up there represent frequencies. You and I think on frequencies. We think on frequencies. I got a phone here that operates on frequencies. See? And I can take your picture and hit send. Woo! Like that. That picture's omnipresent. It's evenly present and 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. Now, where's your thought? Thought is, is thought waves are cosmic waves that penetrate all time and space. But you think on frequencies. You're never going to get to your dream on the frequency that you're working on. You've got to change the frequency. And you see, what you've got here isn't going to take you there. It just isn't going to do it. The thoughts that are giving you this result is never going to take you to that star. And we think if I work hard, no, work hard. Go ahead, work hard. Work hard day and night. It still isn't going to cut it. It will not cut it. You're on the wrong frequency. If you let this bottom line represent an AM frequency and that represent an FM frequency, do you know in the area of consciousness, an AM radio station would not even be aware of the existence of an FM band? That's too far above. You've got to raise your consciousness. And as you raise your consciousness, you don't have to ask what people are like. You're going to know what they're like. They've talked about your intuitive factor. You've got an intuitive factor. I could read your energy like a book. If I walk by you, I know exactly what you're like. You hide nothing. Everything goes on the inside, shows on the outside. What did James Allen say? We think in secret. Yet it comes to pass, environment is but our looking glass. They don't have to wonder what's going on in a person's mind. Look at their life. Look at their results. You see, what we've really got here is a mind game. And you know something? You've got to understand the mind. We do a, uh, a program a couple of times a year. It's called Matrix. Don't have a big group. We have a small group. They come in from all over the world. We do it in Toronto. Just five straight days. We dig into it in depth. Well, here, the last matrix, a man named Abdullah, he's a psychiatrist in Saudi Arabia. He said, I taught him 
more about the mind over the past 16 weeks. He had been studying stuff prior to coming and he had learned in 16 years. He's a psychiatrist in Saudi Arabia. He had been in practice 16 years. Dr. John Mike over in Florida who owns a Montessori school over there. He said I taught him more about the mind in one year than he'd learned in four years of medical school, five years of psychiatric training. I was rather shocked at that because I just taught him what a good doctor taught me. You see, I want to know why this works. I made it work. I want to know why. I'm never going to finish this in 10 minutes, but I will do my best. All right. Okay. Now. Okay. Well, I, I, I will try and speed it up a little bit, but look it. Let's look at the mind and look at paradigms. In fact, let's look at your mind and your paradigm. Now, back in 1934, that's the year I was born. Most people think it was everybody dead that was born then, not me. All right. <laughs> Dr. Truman Fleet was very involved in the healing arts and holistic, holistic health. And he said that nobody's ever seen the mind. Mind is an activity, it's not a thing. And that was one of the primary reasons why we have so much problem, so many problems in the medical field. Because he said, we're treating symptoms, we're not treating the cause of problems at all. We're just treating symptoms. We're treating the effects of problems. We're not treating the problem. You've got to go inside if you're going to treat. So he said, what we need is an image of the mind. And he said, since nobody's ever seen one, I'm going to make one. And he said, let that be the image of the mind. And then he broke it into two parts. And he said, there's the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and of course, the body. Now, without question, this is the most valuable idea I have ever learned in the last 52 years. I had studied all of Napoleon Hill stuff and Carnegie stuff. I got, I've got ring binders of it at home. And I study it every day. I read that book every day. Every day I read Think and Grow Rich. Every day. And I, and I don't read it in any particular place. I just open it and read it. Right? And I will never stop, and for very good reason. I was working at Nightingale Conant, and the people that were working with me knew that I was trying to figure out why I changed, and I couldn't get the answer. And they said, there's a guy giving a seminar in Vancouver this weekend. You should go to it. So I jumped on a plane, and I flew out to Vancouver. And this great big man got up to speak, and the second he opened his mouth, I knew that he knew what he was talking about, and I made up my mind I was going to get to know him. When the seminar was over, I went up and I said, I'd like to spend a couple hours with you. He looked at his watch, and he said, well, I'd probably like to spend a couple hours with you too, but he said, I've got to catch a plane. And I said, I don't mean right now. i got to catch a plane too. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. He said, where do you live? And I said, Chicago. He said, what are you doing out here? I said, I come out to hear you speak. Now, I think he was impressed that I had traveled so far. And I told him, I said, I'd have walked out here if I had known what I was going to get. And so the two of us met in the Skyline Hotel. He said, uh, I'm going to be in Toronto in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to be in Chicago anytime. I said, I'm from Toronto, so I'll come over. So two of us sat down in the Skyline Hotel, and he drew that picture out. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what I learned. And he said, look, it, you've got to understand the mind. He said, the conscious mind is the thinking mind. That's the educated mind. That's where school loads the books up. And he said, that's where your intellect is resident. And you and I have intellectual factors. We've been trained and raised to live through our senses. We've about what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. But you have perception, the will, imagination, memory, intuition, memory. All these are intellectual factors. How do you think I know what these people are like? You're like, you're extremely right brain. You should never take a job behind the desk. You'll never stay there. You're all over the damn place. All right. <laughs> You know, no, not true. Look at the subconscious mind is your emotional mind. That's your emotional mind. Now you see, the conscious mind is the ability to choose. Do you know that all the other little creatures on the planet are totally dis are at home in their environment? They blend in. The birds blend in with the trees. The animals with the, with the forest. You and I are totally disoriented in our environment. And that is because we've been given a godlike ability to create our own environment. And the problem is we don't do it. You know what we do? We let the environment control us. Well, we have the ability to choose. You've got the ability to accept or reject. You can accept or reject anything I'm saying. You can accept or reject anything you read in the paper or see on the news. You know what our problem is? We don't reject any of it. We go locked into it. And then we have the ability to originate. Now, your subconscious mind doesn't have that ability. Your subconscious mind must accept whatever you give to it. It has absolutely no ability to reject. It, uh, it just cannot reject. It must accept. And get this, it cannot differentiate between what's real and what's imagined. 
Carnegie gave, gave Hill a, 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 a directive, and he said, I want you to write this out. Now, this is at the end of a three-day interview. He said, I want you to do something. And so he had him write this out. He said, now take your pen. He said, I want you to read this. Or I want you to write this out, and then I want you to read it every day. Now he said, are you ready to write? I want you to underline every word I'm saying. Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to match your achievements in life, I'm going to meet you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. And Hill said he threw his pencil on the floor. He says, now you know darn well I can't do that. He says, I know you can't, unless and until you plant that idea in your mind. Now he said, write it out, every word. And Hill said the first time he read it, he locked himself in the bathroom. And he whispered it. He was afraid his brother might hear him. He was afraid thought people would think he was crazy. He said, Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to match your achievements in life, I'm going to meet you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Now, Carnegie, I've read where he made 23 millionaires, 25 millionaires, 53 millionaires. He didn't make that many. Napoleon Hill has made millions of millionaires. Now, Hill said he, he made a commitment he'd do it for 30 days, so he said, that isn't going to hurt me, I'll do it for the 30 days. Well, he said, at first he thought he was crazy, but towards the middle of the month, he started to think, maybe this isn't crazy, maybe this will work. By the end of the month, he knew he was going to do it. That really impressed me. I made a similar one for, for Earl Nightingale. I've been to places where they've never heard of Earl Nightingale, but they've heard of me. Why? Because I impressed that upon my subconscious mind. I was looking for an ego trip. When I learned why I changed, all I ever wanted to do was share it with other people. And that's all I did. Now, I was 79 on my last birthday. That's the age Hill was when they made the foundation. I think I'm just warming up. I have no intentions of slowing down. Okay? Now, look at Now, just what I've given you there, I want you to keep that in mind, and let's look what happens here. We'll say, this is you today. This is you today. Information is pouring into your conscious mind. All kinds of information about the economy, about the world going to hell in a handbasket. Now, you've got the ability in your conscious mind because you have a reasoning factor. It's an inductive reasoning factor. Your subconscious mind is totally deductive. The conscious mind for the psych majors reasons inductive and deductive. Subconscious is strictly deductive. But at any rate, because you have a reasoning factor, you can think. And so if we would think and listen to what we're hearing, we'd say, that's ridiculous. And we'd reject it. Earl Nightingale said if most people said what they were thinking, they'd be speechless. The late, the late great doctor. Yeah, well, the, the late and great Dr. Ken McFarland down in Kentucky, he said 2% of the people think, 3% think they think, and he said 95% would actually rather die than think. <laughs> if you listen to most conversations, it's going to become evident people aren't thinking or they'd never say what they're saying. Just stand back and watch the way people behave. It's obvious they're not thinking or they'd never do what they're doing. Look at they're not only not thinking where they could say, get out of here, I'm not listening to that. No, they leave their mind wide open and it goes right to their subconscious mind. Why do they do that? Because they're programmed to do it. That's their paradigm. And that's the way we go around. We go around like that. Hold your hand up like that. Everybody hold their hand up like that for a moment. Put a hand in your cheek here for, in your chin for a minute. Put it in your chin. What are you doing up there? You see? Okay. I screwed that up. All right. <laughs> Every once in a while, I make a mistake. It's rare, but I do make them. All right. Now, look at We leave our mind wide open. Why do we do that? For the same reason we speak the language we speak, like the food we eat, dress the way we dress. We're programmed to do it. Let's close the curtain on that and take a look at how we arrived on the scene. Here we are as little babies. This is us as an infant. That's how we arrived on the scene. Subconscious mind is wide open. Everything that's going on around you is going right into your subconscious mind. That's why you learn the language you learn. I work in different places in the world where a little kid at three and four years old will speak four and five languages and they think nothing of it because the child is surrounded by people that speak four or five different languages, so they learn them. You learn to like the food you like, everything that way. And the information going on around you is being dumped right into your mind. Now, the people say, oh, it's just a baby. They don't know. The subconscious mind knows, and that's how your self-image is formed. Now, you have to ask yourself, what was the environment like where I was born? 
Robert Heinlein wrote a book, uh, Strangers in a Strange Land. He was a science fiction writer back in the 60s. He said, in absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to performing daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by it. This is what happens to us when we're small. That's programmed into our mind. Yet most of what people talk about is daily trivia. Well, you see, self-image is one idea. The image that's controlling your life right now, you did not build. It was built when you were an infant by people who didn't understand the mind from uh, snowballs. They just didn't. Now, the, the self-image is one idea. Your paradigm is a multitude of ideas. So here we are today, living the same as we were living as a baby. Why do you think 1% of the population earns 97% of all the money that Suey earned? Why do you think intelligent, really brilliant people are struggling all the way through life? Well, I'm going to show you why. That started when you were an infant. Now, this is the educational system. Our, our institute, Dr. Gallagher Institute, teaches this. Now, there's, those, they're the sensory factors, those little antennae. You go to school, and you hear what the teacher's saying. And because you hear what the teacher's saying, you gather information. Gathering information is exactly what it implies. It's gathering information. It's books being stored in the consciousness. And then at a given period of time, they come along, they're going to give you a test. They want to know if you know that information. So they give you a test, and they call that knowing. That is not knowing. Knowing is the inward experience. Gathering information is the observation of facts. Now, you don't learn from listening, from hearing, you learn from listening. You hear with your ears, you listen with your emotions. When you listen, odds are pretty good you will learn. Learning is when you consciously entertain an idea, you get emotionally involved in that idea, you step out and act on the idea, and you change the end result. That is learning. It's the feedback from the change of result that's the learning experience. Now look at this for a moment. School gave us valuable knowledge. However, school never taught us how to all of the old paradigms. Therefore, we frequently don't do what we already know how to do. When I was a little kid, the teachers would say, why'd you do that? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why'd you do it? I don't know. <laughs> I went in the Navy. Every commanding officer, Proctor, why'd you do that? I don't know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why'd you do it? I don't know. Every job I had, the boss would say, why are you doing I don't know. I got married. My wife saying, why are you doing that? And I said, drop it right there. You know. Do you know why? We're doing things that we know we shouldn't do. It's giving us results we don't want to get, and we do them anyway. Look at Superior knowledge, inferior results, cause confusion and frustration. Want to change that? Read this book every day for 50 years. You'll change it. Look at Here's a graphic illustration. There's the person with all the knowledge and the consciousness. But the knowledge does not resonate with the results. There's no match between the knowledge the person has and the results they're getting. And we can't figure out why is a person so brilliant and yet gets such bad results. Well, here's why. You see, it isn't the knowledge that controls the results. It's the paradigm that controls the results. People are walking around with lots of information, but they don't know how to execute it. I've been teaching this now for 40-some years all over the world. I have seen some absolutely phenomenal, just astronomical changes take place in people's life when they start to become aware. Now look at If you want to change the results you're getting, there's only one way you're going to do it. You've got to change the results. You've got to change the paradigm. And if you don't change the paradigm, you're going to keep getting the same results. Now, you can cut it any way you want. You can try to shortcut it. You can sugarcoat the pill. That's the bottom line. Okay? Now, look at Here was Carnegie's basic concept. He said, any idea that is held in the mind, any idea that's held in mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available. Any idea that's held in the mind, any idea that's emphasized, that you keep thinking about, that's either feared or revered. Well, the great sufferer in the Bible said that, Job. He says, lo, the thing I fear has come to visit upon me. You've heard that? 
we don't think of what we want, we think of what we don't want. We have to start thinking of what we do want. Go listen to Johnny Nash's song. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I see all obstacles in my way. Or listen to Nat King Cole. On Make Believe. This new one, Pretend. Pretend you're happy when you're blue. It isn't very hard to do. And you'll find happiness without an end whenever you pretend. We can do that. We were given an imagination. In the worst situation, we can see something absolutely beautiful. We control that. Now, that is the bottom line. Now, you know why we're here? We're here to serve others. That is the only reason why we're here. And if you're going to serve others, you have to help them understand that. And if you're going to help them understand it, you better understand it. You can't give what you haven't got. 67 years before the life of Christ, Horace said, Nemo dot quad non about. Freely translated, that means you cannot give what you have not got. Very few people understand that. Well, let's take a look. This is you. This represents you. Okay? There's the idea in your mind. You impress the idea upon the subconscious mind. Now, this image of what we want, this is what tells us where we are at any time. We keep checking where we're at. Where are we at? Where are we at? How many are in sales? Okay, we're always looking at the sales sheet. Where are we at? The image should tell you where you're at. That's where you're at. You don't go by the sales sheets. Now, I know you do that because we were trained to do that with our report card. The report card doesn't tell you what kind of a student the student is. The report card tells you where their mind was at maybe three, four weeks ago. It's got that bugger all to do with where their mind is. You see? But we don't understand that. Now, let's say this is the person you're coaching, or this is the person you're selling over here. This is the other person. I could turn this into sales or coaching or psychology. And look here. They have results. And what do they do? They have sensory factors. And they focus on their present results. On this side, they're focusing on the image that they're emotionally involved with. But this person is focused on their present results. And so they're being controlled by the conditions or circumstance in their life. Why are they doing that? Well, their parents causes them to do that. This poor soul is stuck and they don't even know it. They try to fight existing reality. They'll say, well, look, at, you don't understand. Look at the... Con I understand. If you're going to let what's going on outside control you, that's all you're ever going to have. Kid comes home with a report card. That tells the parent what kind of student they are. It tells the teacher what kind of student they are. Ultimately, the kid thinks, well, that's the kind of student I am. So they get this kid to stay in and cram for a month, and they go to school, and they get a little bit better mark. Well, they just forced it. Their self-image hasn't been changed. Their cybernetic mechanism hasn't been changed. And in nothing flat, the kid's marked right back where they should have been. You don't have to get the kid to study. They've already got the information in their head. You've got to get them to change the image of themselves. They've got to see themselves as a brilliant human being, one God's highest form of creation. You've got to help them understand that. But you can't help them understand it if you don't understand it. And you don't understand it if you don't study. See, the opposite of understanding is doubt and worry. On a conscious level, the opposite of doubt and worry is understanding. There's only one way to get understanding, and that's through study. There is no other way. There is no shortcut. Now, there's many forms of study. Get a hold of Dave's company, and you'll get into Dog Man Dealer's material. Get a hold of the foundation, you'll get into the Napoleon Hill material. Get into the program I've given you. People pay thousands of dollars for that. You got it, it's a gift. Maybe we shouldn't have given it to you because people they get for nothing, they place little or no value on. Okay. Now, now here's where you really want to watch this close. And Greg, I'm sorry I'm going over time, but I, I just have to share this. Right? Okay. Look it. There's your intellect. It's your intellect and your conscious mind, and that's what you think with. But understand this. Everybody's saying you become what you think about. That's not necessarily true. Solomon gave it. He said, you become what you plant in your heart. The heart is in the pump in here in your chest. The heart is the subjective mind, the universal mind. That's what the early Greeks referred to as the heart. That's why Solomon says, as a person thinketh in their heart, so are they. 
Now that's very important we understand that. Let's also understand planted in our heart is our old paradigm and that old paradigm is going to produce results. We want to say not anymore. That's going to get out of town. I am changing my ways. I am going to build the vision. I'm going to do what Carnegie says and I'm going to emphasize it and I'm going to keep repeating it. Now, you want to help other people. Okay? There's the other person. Now, this is a great lesson for salespeople or parents. You got to understand your first responsibility is to find out what the other person wants. You want to motivate your kids? Find out what they want. If you don't find out what they want, you're never going to motivate them. Now, look at you got to help them understand that's their intellectual mind and help them understand that if they're going to get the idea, they got to place it in their subconscious. On a conscious level, that's our educated mind. We communicate through words, gestures, and writing. And it's our responsibility to ask whoever we're trying to help some very provoking questions. Let's cause them to start to understand that they have the ability to think. And they don't just become what they think about. They become what they get emotionally involved with. The idea has got to be planted in their subjective mind. Now, when you ask them what they want, understand this. They're not going to tell you what they want. If anything, they're going to tell you what they think they can get. And their paradigm is controlling that. There's no inspiration in going after what you think you can get. Absolutely none. First little tough part, you're going to quit. You've got to go after what you want. Wants are of a spiritual nature. They come from the essence of who we are. Your spiritual DNA is perfect. It comes from the heart. Want. It's not to get. Wants are to grow. You should be going after something way beyond where you're at. Their paradigm, though, is controlling them. You pretty well know that. You just listen to them. And you've got to get them to think of what they want. And then you have to get them to understand that they've got to turn their want into a goal. Now, they're not going to believe this at first because the paradigm is controlling them. How do we get them to do it? We get the goal in our mind. Ray Stanford changed my life. He believed in me. I did not believe in me. He was telling me all these wonderful things I could do. I did not believe it. But you know what I did believe? The guy was so sincere and he, he spoke with such conviction. I believed he believed I could change. And I believed in his belief in me. And that's what happened. So when you're sitting down and talking to somebody, you better be emotionally involved in their goal. You've got to be emotionally involved in seeing them do what they're telling you they want to do. And then understand you're dealing heart to heart. So don't tell them one thing and be thinking another. You communicate heart to heart through vibration. Let me repeat that. You communicate heart to heart through vibration. There's a beautiful poem that says, if I knew you and if you knew me, and if both of us could clearly see with an inner sight divine the meaning of your heart and mind, I'm sure we'd differ less. We'd clasp our hands in friendliness, and I'm certainly presently agree if I knew you and you knew me. And you see, we've got to be emotionally involved. And when we tell them that we believe they can win, we better be emotionally involved in that. You don't want to let your old paradigm get in there and say, I don't think they're ever going to get it. You've got to understand it's heart to heart. You've got to let them know I can see it happening for you. And you do that, and you're going to see the results that you want in their life. Now, it took me nine years to figure this out. And I studied it every day. And I've never stopped studying it. Every person in this room has exactly the same potential. We have people join our company to teach this. We, have teach, we teach them to teach it, and it's all over the world. It's really great information. Now, explain for higher goals, you have to change the old paradigm. You must. You must begin to think. You must understand there are only two ways to change a paradigm, just two. One is through the constant spaced repetition of an idea that's essentially the opposite of the paradigm, and the other is through an emotional impact. <laughs> now here I'm going to show you. Let this white line represent the sound of a CD player or a DVD or me talking. 
The red line represents you listening to me talking. I will be going along and I'll say something and an idea will hit your mind and you take off on a thought trip. And you move up here onto a thought frequency. You're not listening any longer. Oh, you'll hear it, but you're not listening. You're emotionally involved with a different idea. You're on a different frequency of thought. And then you come down and you start listening again. And this goes on all the time when you're listening. You could listen to the same recording a thousand times and only entertain that one idea once. Because you're forever going on thought trips. As I'm speaking, you went on thought trips. You went home. You thought of somebody else. You're all over the place. Now look at this for a moment. You remember all the knowledge that's stared in the consciousness? It may be all stored up there, but you got to get it down here. And stop and ask yourself this. How many times did your parents have to call you by name before you even recognized your own name? <laughs> over and over and over again. The second time you go to listen to this, what happens? Let's clear the slate. There's where you stopped in those circles. And the next time you listen, you land there. So when the same idea comes up for the second time, you're not even listening. What do you think the odds are of you listening to the same recorded message and getting the same ideas every time? It isn't going to happen. It is not going to happen. That's when I started to understand, driving around, listening to Think and Grow Rich, listening to The Strangest Secret, reading the book over and over and over. Now, when you get that, remember it's a gift. Use it. There are 12 DVDs. Watch it all to satisfy your curiosity. Watch the whole thing. And then make up your mind. You're going to listen to number one, the first one. I've got to keep elastic around this or it falls apart. The pages are coming out of it. Uh, let me take that back. You take the first one and you watch it twice a day for a week twice a day for a week, and there's a guide. It's a very comprehensive guide. You study the guide with the one CD or DVD, and you do that for an entire week, and then the next week you take the second one, and you do the same with it, and you do that for 12 weeks, and then you start all over again. If you'll do that every 12 weeks for a year, I guarantee you, you will be a different human being. You'll be living in a totally different world. And I guarantee you one thing, you're going to like it a whole lot better than the one you're in. This will explain in detail why. Okay. If you want to go back and remember this, the seller is the highest paid professional in the world. I uh, I was going to apologize for taking too long, but I'm not going to apologize. I've enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. All right.